printer out that goes, it goes to the right place. It expects that return for that uh, kernel call to be there. Uh, so we can kind of actually use this as the next push, as the first push for our next system call, as long as we're careful about how we maintain the stack. So at this point, we should have successfully done our SO socket call, and we should get a, a good socket return back from this. All right. Uh, so socket actually uh, alters EDX, in case you're wondering. Um, so we're going to push EAX, and we're going to pop it out into ECX. Because we did one push and one pop, our stack is still in the same state, so we can still use EDI as our first push uh, to the next call. Then we're going to do a sysbind. So we move our uh, move the number for sysbind. We push uh, this odd-looking string here, which is going to be uh, basically our sock adder instruct, which needs to be null terminated. So that's why we pushed EDI in our prior call as our dummy return value. Uh, so now we move ESP. That's on the, our sock adder sits on the stack. So we move our stack pointer into ESI. Now ESI is a pointer to our sock adder structure. We push byte 16, which is going to be the length argument to our next call. We push the pointer to the sock adder. We push the socket, which is ECX, which if you remember, we save that from our socket call. Uh, so now we've correctly set up all the arguments on the stack for our bind call. And we need to push, again, the dummy value before our system call or our software interrupt. So at this point, we should have successfully done a bind. Now we can do a listen. Uh, interesting thing about listen, listen requires a socket uh, as the first argument, and so did bind. So it's actually already sitting there on the stack in the right place. So as long as we don't muck with the stack, when we do our listen, we don't have to set up any of the arguments. We just have to put the right value in the EAX. So all of these things are here because conceptually, if you were just doing this from scratch, this is probably how you would go about doing it. But if we're cognizant about what the stack actually looks like, we don't have to. We can just do our, our system call, and the socket is already there, and the backlog we don't really care about. It can be any value as long as it's uh, greater than one, I think. Right? So as long as whatever's there is greater than one, which is going to be a pointer to our sock adder instruct, if it's a pointer, it's got to be greater than one. So uh, we can use that as our backlog. So we have a huge backlog, which you don't normally see in programming, but it still works. So our next call would be accept. Uh, we push our uh, uh, doo -doo -doo. okay. This is kind of weird because again, stuff is sitting on the stack. But uh, for here, we're using our dummy value is going to be uh, our call for the FCNTL to do our dupe two for the next loop. So we're, again, we're pushing as the dummy value a value that we're going to use later on, so we're not wasting that uh, those bytes in the uh, payload in the shell code. Then we do our dupe two loop. Uh, this is a very common loop uh, in all shell code. This is basically going to uh, do a little bit of a dance where you push some stuff on the stack and you pop it back off so that you can maintain counter state across calls. And uh, the, the kind of subtle oddity is that we have this sub call thing going on where we're actually calling SCNTL instead of dupe two. So that's, all, that's, all, that's where you get the big difference. Uh, but basically, basically we're decrementing um, EVX as we go through here. Uh, to duplicate file descriptors 2 and 1 and 0 onto our socket so that our file descriptors end up going remotely across our socket and when we type stuff into our exec ve program that environment has been copied across so when we type stuff uh, it actually stuff typed remotely goes to our bin shell and the bin shell output can come back to our remote client right so we can actually interact with the shell the interactive part of the shell uh, and then we do our exec VE. Again, this is very uh, common code. We null terminate our, our bin shell string or whatever shell you're trying to execute. You say a pointer to that and so forth. And uh, you move your exec VE. And as arguments, you get a pointer to the string. And then you get the, uh, the argv and then your NP. And your environment can be null in this case. And we execute it and we get our shell working. So uh, that's the only one I'm going to go through because you can kind of see the, the thought process and how bind shell works. And you can work through the, the slides on your own and get through the, the thought process on how the other examples work. All right, so uh, let's remove uh, the slide 43 binary. All right, so I'll do a, a NASM using NASM assembler uh, binary format. So on a previous slide, we, we specified ELF there because we were going to execute it uh, natively. We just wanted to do a dot slash a dot out and have our shellcode run. In this case, we want actual shellcode so that we can see the size. So we don't want to link it. We don't want to wrap the ELF header around it or anything. We just want the actual binary blob. So we'll specify NASM to, uh, to assemble it uh, as binary. 
All right, so we get a word, a D word error, that's on that, that long uh, string that's specifying the sock adder. Uh, so don't worry about that. So we'll look at the size. Uh, slide 43. All right, so we can see that uh, the, the size is 84 bytes, which is uh, pretty respectable for uh, a shell code that's not staged or anything. Um, so we'll come back to this size later. So now let's go over to Solaris. And we can see over here we have a couple of things. We have our vulnerable programs that we saw earlier. So if I look at these, oops, no, vi and Solaris, no vim and Solaris. All right, if we look at these, you can see that they, they are, in fact, just the same thing that on the slide. We create a buffer, we uh, read a RV, and then we transfer control to our buffer here. All right, so uh, if I look at the word count on the, the payloads that are already over here on the Solaris box, there right, we can see that uh, we have these sizes. So uh, the sizes increment. So this one is going to be our bind shell, this one is going to be callback, and this one is going to be fine sock for the different slides that are coming up here. Thanks. All right, so anyway, basically we're going to uh, run our vulnerable program, and as a single argument, we're going to use the shell code. Uh, so we're going to do a bind sock in this case. Uh, the 8813 translates to uh, port 5000 in uh, the human readable port way. So at this point, our vulnerable program is running. It's gone through, and it's copied stuff into that buffer, and uh, it, it immediately started executing our shell code. So some of the system calls have already happened, and it's basically waiting, and it's listening state at this point. So a highly vulnerable program, uh, let's see here, can I save some typing? Yes, I can save some typing. So I do some netcat, uh, netcat to my Solaris box, and uh, I specify the port that was pre-known in my bind shell, and like so many security uh, examples, it was very boring and it's not very flashy, right? So at that point we have exploited our highly vulnerable program and we are now connected to our uh, shell code. So we could do things like ID, you can see root, you can uh, uh, uname and see that we're actually on a Solaris box. We know that that window was, was uh, a Fedora VM. So we're actually on there. Uh, we can cancel out and we can see that it stops. Uh, we can actually use trust. Uh, have a sock adder reuse issue. Let me, let me just jump to the next one. Uh, we could do it again with our callback code uh, just to demonstrate and show that it works. So now we use netcat uh, as a listener. Right, so we'll, we'll set it up to listen on 5,000. So now it's 5,000 on the floor box. Now you've executed your, now the vulnerable program is the exploit. And when it transfers to the payload, it does the callback code. And now uh, the, the connection kind of went the other direction, right? So now I have an ID that just kind of magically appeared over on my listening netcat over here. And uh, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's hard to demonstrate that this stuff actually is doing what I'm saying it's doing, right? So can do a cat Etsy release and see that we're on Solaris or something. I don't know, kind of hand wave and hope that it's working. Uh, so anyway, we can terminate that. Uh, here we can, uh, since I don't have a reuse issue, I can actually use trust to show you uh, the syscalls, right? So trust dot slash uh, vulnerable program slide 44. All right, so let me scroll back up. Uh, or should I scroll down? Where's the stuff? All right, right up here. All right, here you can see that we're doing a, an SO socket. We have our inode, a socket, a stream. We have our, our null value that we don't really know what it does. We have our SOV default. So in this particular example, um, I'm kind of playing by the rules, and we're passing valid values here. So we have SOV default. We see our dupe 2 stuff going on. Uh, we have our bind shell, and uh, so forth. If we look at a different one, like the bind shell, we can see here, not there, we can see here that uh, in this particular payload, I'm not, I'm not particularly worried about maintaining the SOV uh, area, whether it's one or two or three or whatever. So I set up my socket, and you can see that my SOV value is this crazy weird number. This is whatever was outside of my stack frame. This is whatever was sitting on the stack when my shellcode started executing. So we might really be worried about that. But regardless, when we get further down here, you can see that binds SOV is this huge negative number. So I, I mean, it literally doesn't seem to matter what that socket version is. Um, this one is going to be some byproduct from my previous pushes, where it's interpreting a pointer or, or something. 
uh, so we can see those working and somehow accidentally or I know